Hi, I'm Matt Davis. This video is about the relationship of the Circle Line and London's mainline termini. Prior to the railways, London was already a growing city of one and a half million people with many streets and buildings that still exist today. Most of its neighbourhoods had narrow thoroughfares creating an intangible mess that cartographers found challenging. The streets were busy. Mail coaches were expected to reach Newmarket some 63 miles away within 8 hours and 5 changes of horses. They travelled at 10 miles an hour, possibly the fastest vehicles on the streets save for hansom cabs and private coaches. There were 60,000 horses at work in the capital, not only driving carriages but pulling carts or driving machinery in the paint factories and breweries. Then there were sheep and cattle driven on the hoof to market weekly for slaughter. Pigs and cows were kept in yards and gardens and their colossal food requirements were all being brought into the city. Some roads had been created solely for cattle traffic, such as the New Road, the current Marleybone and Euston roads. Smithfield had expanded twice by 1846 and was processing 1.7 million animals a year and there were countless private slaughterhouses dealing with animals from farms from all corners of London. Note that by 1849 56% of Smithfield's cattle was shipped by rail but for the remaining two miles they were herded in. With regards to people, everyone went about their day on foot. Children, whether working or at school, were littering the streets as well as adults marketing wares. The streets were very busy, so when the Great Western opened in Paddington, it was four and a half miles from Smithfield and still in open fields. Six railway termini at Spa Road, London Bridge, Paddington, Euston, Bishopsgate and Fenchurch Street had opened by 1844, after just six years of railways entering the capital and within a decade and a half since the Rainhill Trials. In 1846, after travellers from Romford, Croydon, Bletchley, Tring, Watford, Harrow, Maidenhead and Colchester were pouring into the capital, a Royal Commission on Metropolitan Railway Termini had been set up to discuss and reject more routes from penetrating the capital with many suggesting more central stations. Landlords had been keen to promote and support the railways coming into the capital, welcoming compulsory slum demolition. But the richer landowners of substantive properties in the more salubrious locations were much less favourable and would need to be compensated, as well as numerous owners of smaller holdings which was well in excess of the railway's expenses. And the population was increasing by almost 20% each decade. Given that the Great Western and London and Birmingham had all laid short of the capital, yet the eastern counties had landed itself directly into the square mile, there was a concern the capital would be nothing but a series of viaducts similar to that in the Southwark of today. So, on the 8th of April 1846, the Home Secretary, on behalf of the Queen, informed the commissioners that they should direct their special attention to the problem of whether the extension of railways into the centre of the metropolis was calculated to afford such additional convenience or benefit to the public as would compensate for the sacrifice of property, the interruption of important thoroughfares and interference with other suggested plans of improvement. Although Waterloo had been approved by an act in 1845, there were a number of railway applications in process and all were rejected following this ruling as they all called for central locations. Charles Pearson, a solicitor working for the City of London, suggested in 1845 an underground railway working on compressed air through the Fleet Valley to Farringdon. It was ridiculed and rejected by the Commission. Pearson also suggested in 1846 a subterranean railway, 80 feet wide, following the River Fleet, that connected the Metropolitan Termini, initially linking Paddington in the west to Farringdon in the east, where he proposed an enormous station capable of serving five mainline railway companies. The line would also serve Euston and King's Cross. The suggestion was rejected in favour of a boundary line of which no railway could pass to protect the ancient city of this modern intrusion. 
This resulted in a defined boundary for which no railway could pass, which was bounded by London Bridge, Borough High Street, Blackman Street, Borough Street, Lambeth Road, Vauxhall Road, Vauxhall Bridge, Vauxhall Bridge Road, Grosvenor Place, Park Lane, Edgware Road, New Road, City Road, Finsbury Square and Bishopsgate. Today's tourist destinations that existed then included St Paul's Cathedral and London Zoo, represented here to give some geographical pointers. The short three and three quarter mile London and Greenwich Railway from Deptford via a lift bridge was the first to serve London. Initially it travelled entirely over a brick viaduct to Spa Road, opening on the 8th of February 1836. It was the first steam railway in the capital, with some trial running over the previous six months. The railway was extended via Bermondsey Street into London Bridge on the 14th of December. The terminus was a modest affair with two exposed platforms, railway offices and a booking hall. In comparison, the 112 mile London and Birmingham Railway opened with trains running between Hemel Hempstead and Euston. Services commenced on the 20th of July 1837, completing the full line in September the following year. The journey to Birmingham was five and a half hours. Such was the enormity of 29 year old Brunel's railway that it stood proud outside of the city. At first, at a temporary 1838 halt that became the goods depot, but a triple span shed covering four platforms of 700 feet length did not arrive as today's Paddington until 16 years later. In 1839, at Mile End in East London, Devonshire Street had been the terminus of the Eastern Counties Railway prior to extending to its London station, naming it Shoreditch upon opening on the 1st of July 1840. On the 20th of July the following year, the London and Blackwall Railway opened Fenchurch Street in the City of London. The two platforms were served by carriages only, where an incline in Minories provided access to the engines bound for Greenwich and Blackwall. Bow was first served in 1849 and Essex in 1854. In 1844, following overcharging by the London and Greenwich for access into London Bridge, the London and Croydon and the South Eastern Railways created their own junction controlled by the world's first signal box, which guided trains over a wooden trestle into their own station, Bricklayer's Arms. The London and Greenwich relented in 1854 and the station fell out of use to passengers, retaining freight traffic until 1981. The Royal Commission was set up by Robert Peel in April 1846 and their decision was made public on the 27th of June. The previous year had seen an act passed to allow trains to reach Waterloo, which escaped the boundary ban, opening July 1848. Subsequent railways were rejected when they applied beyond the boundary. Plans for King's Cross were made in 1848, so this was the first station to follow the Metropolitan Termini ruling, opening 14th of October 1852. A temporary station had been built in York Way in 1850, but soon made way for the largest station in England, built on the alleged grave of Boudicca, between platforms 9 and 10, immortalised by Rowling's Magician's Entrance. On the 1st of October 1860, two stations opened, their working name being Grosvenor Terminus. Connected, as far as passengers were concerned, the London, Brighton and South Coast and the London, Chatham and Dover Railways addressed the issue that no termini crossed the river and main business was on the north side. A temporary station, awkwardly named Pimlico, though actually in Battersea, had been constructed by railways taken over by the London, Chatham and Dover. John Fowler built Grosvenor Bridge and the station name was settled with Victoria because it was on Victoria Street. The London, Brighton and South Coast station was ten tracks and six platforms with a grand shed and an entrance on Victoria Street whereas the London, Chatham and Dover's entrance was on Wilton Road, constructed of wood with eight platforms of mixed gauge to accommodate Great Western trains. 
Royal Assent had been granted for the North Metropolitan Railway in 1854 to build an underground railway from Paddington via King's Cross to Farringdon with an extension to the post office close to St Paul's Cathedral. The route was altered by an act in 1859 giving the funding and dropping the extension south of Farringdon. A 10 metre wide trench was dug by navvies through the new road allowing broad gauge trains to share the system and with the increasingly popular absolute block signalling. Trial running commenced late 1861, the first full length trip in May 1862 and opened to the public on Saturday the 10th of January 1863. Stations were Paddington, Bishop's Road, Edgware Road, Baker Street, Portland Road, Gower Street, King's Cross and Farringdon Street. Nine and a half million passengers were carried in the first 12 months with six trains per hour in the peak. During 1863, a parliamentary select committee discussed further extending the Metropolitan Railway to connect with the other railway termini in such a fashion as to create an inner circle, and the Metropolitan District Railway was formed to build a railway from the planned Metropolitan route in an easterly and counterclockwise direction. Exactly a year later, Charing Cross opened well within the 1846 boundary but occupied a site cleared shortly before by the failed Hungerford Market. Brunel's suspension bridge of 1845 was replaced to make way for the double track bridge with pedestrian path which tripled and quadrupled in less than a year. The Charing Cross Railway Company opened the station on the 11th of January 1864 and was quickly absorbed into the South Eastern. Another site in the city was the Detours Fleet Prison, which had been demolished in 1846 and lay vacant. The London Chatham and Dover Railway, seeking access to London across the river, like they had at Victoria, opened a new branch at Brixton, later to become Loughborough Junction, to Ludgate Hill, with its own viaduct. The station occupied the old prison's footprint. Broad Street was on a branch from the East and West India Docks and Birmingham Junction Railway, which later became the North London Railway. Trains from Bow to Hampstead, then a junction at Dawson opened and made the trips from Bow to Fenchurch Street obsolete. Broad Street and the NLR also fell into obsolescence as the tube, bus and railway network expanded, despite being the third busiest London station at the end of the 19th century. During construction of the Metropolitan Railway, power was granted to build a station at Moorgate. The Midland Railway's extension into St Pancras was under construction and trains would initially call into Moorgate whilst delays to St Pancras occurred. This Met extension would also benefit GNR trains from King's Cross and the section from Farringdon to Moorgate would be four track on two levels. Moorgate Street opened on the 23rd of December 1865 with an intermediate station at Aldersgate Street, both with four platforms serving the two routes of the four tracked city widened lines. Eight days later, on the 1st of January, a junction opened at Farringdon Street, creating a path for the London Chatham and Dover's Snow Hill Tunnel, some 43 chains from Ludgate Hill. The junction also created an eastern spur so northbound trains from Hearn Hill could terminate at Moorgate. This junction would get more complicated in the following years with good sidings for Smithfield for the Great Western, White Cross Street for the Midland, and West Street for the Great Northern. This is not entirely dissimilar from Charles Pearson's plans rejected by the Metropolitan Railway. Objecting to the London Chatham and Dover's breach of the city limits into Ludgate Hill, the South Eastern Railway proposed a route from west of London Bridge over the river into Cannon Street Station over a track of just 60 chains. The station opened on the 1st of September 1866. The two towers in the style of Christopher Wren's work that face the river are the only remains of the original station. 1868 was a busy year. In April, Baker Street East opened, that's now platforms 1 to 4, where the Metropolitan extended northwest. Trains only went as far as Swiss Cottage along a single track. In 1880 it extended to Harrow and double-tracked two years later. 
the service stood alone from the Met mainline despite a through service capability. On the 1st of October, on an area alleged to be slums and diverting the Fleet River, St Pancras opened for the Midland Railway. The station, needing to clear the Regent's Canal, is 20 feet above the street level, so the basement was utilised for Burton beer, with girders measured against the width of the barrels. Engineers Barlow and Aldish were used to build the station and the 75 metre wide glass and iron train shed. Prior to the grand opening, some services ran via the Metropolitan and City Widened lines underneath the station from July. Continental service boat trains ran from St Pancras from 1894 to 1963. On the same day, the Metropolitan opened their extension as part of the inner circle from Paddington to Brompton, Gloucester Road, and before the end of the year, the district joined at Gloucester Road from West Brompton and opened a further five stations as far as Westminster Bridge. New stations included Bayswater, Notting Hill Gate, Kensington High Street and Brompton, Gloucester Road in October, and then South Kensington, Sloan Square, a new station at Victoria, St James's Park and Westminster Bridge in December. Utilising the construction of Basilgate's Victoria Embankment, the District Railway continued to head toward the completion of the circle. On the 30th of May 1870, Charing Cross, the Temple and Blackfriars were added to the line. Although the main line crossed over the district's Blackfriars station, there was no related station for a further 16 years. The gradual work toward connecting the Met and district continued, and in 1871 the district reached Mansion House. Arguments then broke out between the two railways regarding completion and access at the Tower of London, where the circle would turn back to the west. In 1874, Holborn Viaduct opened and Snow Hill opened its doors as a through station to the London Chatham and Dover on the 1st of October. Due to its proximity to Holborn Viaduct being less than three chains apart, they interchanged with each other. Later Snow Hill was renamed Holborn Viaduct Low Level. The Great Eastern Railway had formed in 1862 and was pushing to extend their acquired Eastern Counties Railway terminus further into the city from Bishopsgate, which was in one of the poorest locations of the city. The first attempt for a West End location was rejected, but in February 1874, Liverpool Street opened from a short extension. In July 1875, the Metropolitan Line station opened and by the 1st of November, Bishopsgate became goods only as Liverpool Street took full control. On the 18th of November 1876, the Met reached Aldgate. Further progress was hampered with disagreements between them and the district regarding the Tower of London meeting point and it took an Act of Parliament to resolve this issue. The district were heading east to Whitechapel. On the 25th of September 1882, the Met had almost completed their portion of the Circle Line and opened a station at the Tower of London. When the district extended from Cannon Street to Whitechapel via East Cheap, they connected on the 6th of October 1884 at a larger joint station opened at Mark Lane, where the Met's Tower of London station was abandoned. The building completed the Circle Line, though did not appear on the tube map until 1949. When the station closed in 1967, it was demolished with the current Tower Hill, which was built on a demolished station. Earlier, in March 1884, both railways had built a line from Liverpool Street to St Mary's Station on the route to Whitechapel via Aldgate East as part of the act to connect the inner circle. After three weeks of opening, East Cheap was renamed The Monument. In May 1886, St Paul's Mainline Station opened, to be later renamed as Blackfriars in the 1930s. In August 1898, the London and South Western, wishing a central London station, completed their underground railway from Waterloo to City Station, now Bank. It remained in the mainline service until 1994, when London Underground took over. On the 15th of March 1899, the Great Central reached London at Marleybone, utilising much of the Metropolitan's track from Quainton Road to Finchley Road. The underground station did not arrive until 1907. 
In February 1904, the Great Northern and City Railway reached the City of London at the Metropolitan's Moorgate Street Station. In the early part of the 20th century, the tube lines had started to appear, crisscrossing the city in the subsoil of the London clay. Some stations were renamed. By now, the 1846 boundary was in the distant past, even though its present still lingers. In 1912, Snow Hill is renamed Holborn Viaduct Low Level for five years before its eventual closure shortly after Spa Road. For the next 60 years, there are many station name changes far too numerous to keep up with the commentary. Ludgate Hill closes in 1929 and in 1967, Mark Lane is reopened as Tower Hill. Bricklayer's Arms, which suffered bomb damage during World War II and was not repaired by the time British Rail converted to diesel, eventually fell out of regular use, finally closing in 1981. The viaduct remains as part of the Mandela Way trading estate. Liverpool Street was refurbished in 1979 as part of a package to include Broad Street. After diverting the services into Liverpool Street, Broad Street became obsolete and the refurbishment did not come. By 1985, the morning peak was just 300 commuters using a solitary platform, inevitably closing on the 30th of June 1986. Demolition began in November. Once a route served by five different railway companies, the North-South Snow Hill Tunnel fell out of use in the 1960s when other lines closed after beaching, making this route no longer viable. Track was lifted in the 1970s and the tunnel lay abandoned until 1986 when works began to resume for the Thameslink route. Holborn Viaduct closed 29th of January 1990 and reopened on the 29th of May as St Paul's Thameslink and named City Thameslink the following year. The line gained considerable refurbishment during the £6 billion Thameslink 2000 project which continues in some part and had a hand in preparation for Crossrail at Farringdon. Approved as a project in 2007 and discussed since 1941, Crossrail's £19 billion railway is nearing completion at the production of this video. Its operating name is the Elizabeth Line. It crosses through London and four Circle Line stations at Liverpool Street, Moorgate, Farringdon and Paddington. Farringdon's original building still exists where in 1863 it served four trains an hour. When the Elizabeth line opens to a full service, Farringdon will have the capacity for 154 trains an hour. Further railways will also impact the Circle line, especially Euston upon the opening of HS2, and if Crossrail 2 ever goes ahead, despite being shelved, the intended route has a station named Euston St Pancras and would also call it Victoria. London has had other Circle lines. Apart from the inner circle built and operated by the Metropolitan and District Railways, there was a middle circle operated by the Great Western running from Moorgate to Mansion House via Paddington, Shepherd's Bush and Gloucester Road. An outer circle from the London and North Western operating as the North London from Broad Street to Victoria via Dalston Junction, Gospel Oak, Willesden Junction and Olympia and the super outer circle which ran for two years supplying coal to Kensington by the Midland from St Pancras to Earls Court via Kentish Town, Cricklewood, Harlesden, South Acton and Hammersmith. In 2009, London Overground completed a full circle occupying tracks of previous circles and additionally through Imperial Wharf, Wandsworth Road, Peckham Rye, Surrey Quays and Whitechapel though trains do not run the entire loop as one service. In 1808, on land now owned by the University College of London, Cornish engineer Richard Trevithick sold rides on his circular railway which gained speeds of up to 15 miles per hour. The locomotive lacked flanged wheels and his track was made of short L-shaped iron rails which soon gave way to the soft ground underneath, causing a derailment. His exhibitions had been successful, but his lack of a formal education led to poor financial management. In 
He died in Dartford, Kent in 1833 and would have known of the rise of the steam locomotives but missed trains to London by three years. Thanks for watching. The positive feedback I receive drives me to make further videos so please comment or discuss your knowledge of these tube stations, mainline termini and catch me who can. Don't forget to like and subscribe or click here for other videos and please tell your friends, clubs, societies and Facebook groups.